she mentioned the project manager. Uh, Ashley is the uh, project manager for Liverpool Neighbourhoods. Um, and just before we start, so of course, I you will you've got that little notice. I have to say that we are recording this meeting. If you don't want your picture on the screen, then please turn off your uh, video uh, because it will then go up onto our YouTube website so other people can view it at a later date. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Thanks ever so much. Um... Uh, just say hi everybody um we've got claire here uh who's going to do a presentation after me um and then um uh, uh and then as dave was saying we've got uh katina uh rachel guy but i'm not quite sure in which order people want to do it but let's let's say that that's the running order um i think it would be really good if we could do sort of questions and answers in between each section that would be that would be fantastic and then uh it it, it probably just um helps helps with the flow a little bit um, we should also possibly have uh, Jan and uh, Joe on the call from my team who might be able to help answer questions from uh, from their perspective as well as we go through. So um, I'll just share my screen and um, bring up a sort of short presentation that I've got to, uh, to, uh, to run through. Um, but I'm actually quite keen uh, to spend more, more of the time than anything uh, on Q&A, if that would be possible. Um, right, let's just see if I've got this working right. Now then, is that working for everybody? Have we got uh, the Liverpool Neighbours side? Fantastic. Okay, so uh, quick run through, developing Liverpool Neighbours, what it means for your forum area. In terms of what we'll talk about, uh, what are Liverpool Neighbourhoods, if that's okay, um, why we need them, uh, where the first phase of Liverpool Neighbours are, uh, because we are looking at potentially a, a long-term programme here for the council. Um, what we've achieved so far, uh, what we're currently doing now as a team, um, and then as I say, um, uh, a good, good chunk of time for questions and answers, if that's all right. Okay, so diving in, uh, what are Liverpool Neighbourhoods? Um, it's really, uh, for me, it's more a sort of rebalancing exercise. Um, what we're looking at doing is providing fairer access and amenity for all road users um, or all users of that sort of uh, uh, highway and that public realm space, uh, not just for motorists. So uh, what we're talking about potentially is more, uh, more space for safer active travel. Uh, that can be walking, wheeling or public transport. Healthier, pleasant, uh, more pleasant spaces to, for people to sit and meet. I think that's a really important point that's sometimes overlooked. Um, and these aren't just about uh, a series of traffic interventions. So Liverpool Neighbours is not about a series just of traffic interventions. It's also sch schemes aimed at improving health and well-being, uh, a very important outcome of what we're trying to, trying to do here. So I think, as I say, my takeaway from that first slide is that this isn't, it isn't about uh, stopping people doing things necessarily. It's about just finding that rebalance um, that perhaps we might have lost. Okay, if I can manage to get to the second slide, do that. Um, different focus. Okay, so um, in terms of typical features for livable neighbourhoods, um, we're doing things like wider pavements, dropped curbs, dedicated lanes for uh, safer cycling uh, and wheeling. Um, modal filters, vehicle restrictions, they do feature um, where they're appropriate. Um, and they potentially, uh, all those things to some extent, also free up space for, for public realm improvements as well. Uh, so more green planting, street furniture, wayfinding is often an important thing, uh, and places. I mean, simple things that people have said to us um, and certainly come through in the, in the uh, exercises that we've done so far are, are, you know, simple things like benches so that people who want to walk, who uh, probably need to, uh, to do a journey and rest on the way, can actually then make that journey by foot. Um, so it's a whole range of things, as I say, through, from traffic interventions through to what, what you may think is relatively simple things like benches uh, and such like, but they're all enabling people to, to get around um, in ways other than perhaps using a car and just creating that, as I say, rebalancing um, of, the, of the highway and the, and the public realm. Um, what we're really doing then, as I say, is helping communities uh, uh, uh to 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 look at rebalancing the way that they they move around uh helping to meet our climate and ecological emergency objectives and the way that we're doing this program uh in terms of engaging with residents and, and really going through a sort of co-design process is all part of that agenda of giving people a uh, a greater say so what we're bringing forward i think uh rather uniquely actually 
um, it's been led by communities and it's more that we're supporting communities in then delivering their ambitions rather than perhaps the usual way which would be that we would come up a scheme up with a scheme and then consult on it uh, or engage in consult on it um, and then go forward from there so a slightly different spin on how that we're we're actually working with communities in this instance um, livable neighbors aren't new uh, they've been successfully developed uh, in numerous places around the world um, However, I think the way that we're approaching it in Bath is, is perhaps a bit, a bit unique. Um, that co-design approach that we're taking uh, with people and with communities, I think is very, very important and very, very valuable. Um, and the other thing that I think is important in the, in the Bath and North East Somerset context is um, we're also doing livable neighbourhoods out at places like Temple Cloud and Whitchurch Village and Queen Charlton and, uh, and such like. And I think that's something that's not really been attempted before. And I know when we've been to those forum events, um, there's been some interesting follow-up conversations about how we, we, we might do livable neighbourhoods in other villages as well. So um, I think that's an important, important point to make as well. Um, why do we need these livable neighbourhoods? Um, I think, you know, we're talking about active travel, uh, talking about encouraging people to do more walking and cycling. Um, that does help with that rebalancing exercise I keep talking about. But also, it's really important in, in terms of people's health and well-being. Um, and, and if I think about that rebalancing, what we're doing at the moment often is uh, we're discouraging those people who would perhaps like to walk and cycle from doing so. Uh, so I think that's a really, really important point. Uh, clearly, if we can reduce our car use, we can reduce our CO2 emissions, and we are, are starting to address things like the climate and ecological emergencies. Um, also, we're looking at putting more green infrastructure in when we can. It's not always possible, uh, particularly in a, a historic environment like we have. Um, but again, trying to address where we can anyway, uh, those ecological emergency objectives as well. Um, we're also potentially uh, putting those that are most vulnerable at the greatest risk in the current scenario. If I take a uh, clean air zone, um, uh, a lot of that pollution uh, on London Road is also where people who've got... Um, a uh, little choice perhaps about where they live um, uh, and, you know and, and it's probably it's affecting them uh, so you know as I say getting that rebalancing right uh, is important um, giving people also uh, spaces in which they can play outdoors perhaps exercise or just sit and relax uh, and talk to others I think is also a really important point um, the final point on this slide uh, Claire will talk about this more um, but I think we're quite big on that, that, that these, these interventions that we're talking about are really just a start, they're just an enabler, um, and we all have an important part to play in reducing emissions, improving in air quality and improving our own health. You know, um, we can put these things in, but it's really then down to communities to make, to make them work and, and to make the most of them. Uh, I think that's a really important point. Another important point for me anyway is is thinking about, you know, when we're taking that vehicle out, uh, where, where we're driving, you know, whether we're routing through main routes or whether we're routing through residential neighbourhoods is, is, is something to be, uh, to be thinking about. And how we're driving, I think, is also important. So being respectful of others on the road who might be walking and cycling. Um, and so we're not putting those people off who would, who would like to take those alternative modes. Um, so I think there's a lot, a lot to do, and Claire will talk about that in perhaps a bit more detail in the next sort of section. Um, one second. Okay, in terms of where we are, um, first phase, as I say, you can see there. There's a mix of uh, a lot of a lot of areas of Bath. Um, so what we're looking at, twelve areas of Bath, um, but then also uh, around about at Temple Cloud, um, over at Bath Eastern, and then over at Queen Queen Charlton and Rich Church Village. So quite an ambitious program. So we're we, 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 as you can quite expect, we're quite busy. <laughs> so there's quite a lot to do in, in a rel relatively short period of time, um, but it's good. Uh, and all these areas are bringing forward really good ideas for their communities. So we're going to go on to the next slide. So in terms of what we've achieved so far, um, if we go back to 2020, uh, that was when we talked about the strategy with people, consulted on that uh, liberal neighbourhood strategy. Um, moving on from there, summer 2021, uh, a, good, a good number, 48 communities came forward to request liberal neighbourhoods. Um, a shortlisting exercise was done and 15 areas were prioritised for this first phase. Um, 
We then in winter 2021 held a public engagement where we asked communities to identify broad themes about their areas. So things like what was good about their area, what issues they experienced and sort of broad themes about what they would like to see improved. Then we've kind of built on that over the summer. Uh, so the summer just gone. Um, we've worked with residents in, uh, in what we call co-design workshops or co-development workshops um, to help them develop their ideas around their livable neighbourhoods. So to take those initial sort of themes, um, identify then from those themes and those ideas and those issues, uh, potential solutions on maps. And we've then fed that back in a series of in-person exhibitions uh, where we showcase the outcomes from those workshops and ask communities to comment and prioritize on what they might like to see in a preliminary design. So let's just run back across that. We, we had that uh, series of workshops with people where essentially the communities came up with their, their own sort of solutions to these problems. We've then checked back with them, and I'll be completely honest, on occasion we got things, uh, we captured things incorrectly and they've needed to be fixed. Um, not too many, um, given the, the vast number of interventions that we had to capture in the first place, but still that was a good exercise in terms of validating the output from the workshops that we captured. Um, and then we've asked communities to prioritise things that they would like to see brought forward into a preliminary design. Um, we've not just done those exercises uh, too, we also worked with uh, our colleagues at Sustrans um, and we took our workshop on the road and visited local groups like schools, youth clubs and lunch clubs uh, to try and get a broader audience to contribute um, where they might find it harder to come to workshops and have their say. Um, I think we can do better. I think we can do more on that and we're already planning planning a, a, a kind of revised version and revised and better version of that for the for the next round of engagement that we do. Okay. Uh, Really importantly for us, and this is something that uh, I'm extremely keen on, um, is that we publicise everything that we do and make it public. Okay, clearly there's the, uh, the cabinet reports and all the rest of it in the usual way, but we're gradually, Jan is doing a superb job with the web team of building out uh, a livable, livable neighbourhoods kind of site, uh, which explains what livable neighbourhoods are, um, looks in terms of, if you click into the Your Livable Neighbourhoods box, looks in the detail of where we are with all the 15 areas that we're looking at, uh, talks in detail about the co-design workshops, if you want to go in that way. Um, another thing that we've brought forward at this moment in time is three through traffic restriction trials. So uh, Guy, is, uh, Guy is, I think, looking forward to a trial in Southlands. Um, and we'll talk about that in a, perhaps uh, when, when Guy comes on. Um, we've got another one on Church Street. Uh, which is coming forward in the next uh, week or two. Um, and the final one is in Queen Charlton, actually, Queen Charlton Lane uh, between Queen Charlton and Whitchurch Village. Um, so those three traffic restriction trials are about to be implemented. Um, people will have plenty of opportunity to feedback. That's through what's called an experimental TRO process, uh, which allows people to feedback for a good six months. Um, and then we can uh, assimilate that feedback uh, and take a view on, on, on how we take these uh, take, we take these restrictions forward. Um, we've also got, just to sort of finalise that slide, we've also got, um, uh, you know, the, the, the previous, you know, summary of the previous consultations that were undertaken, and finally, a sort of overall timeline, um, uh, which just sets out what the, what the programme is. Okay, keep pressing the wrong button, I'm sure. Okay, in terms of what we're doing now, so final bit really for me, um, and then we can move on to Q&A. Um, really what we're doing is we've taken the uh, measures that have come out, the interventions that have come out of the uh, exhibition exercise, uh, sorry, the shortlist, what am I talking about? The co-design and exhibition exercise. And we're now as a team assessing those against various factors, including cost, practicalities, and timelines to inform a short list of interventions to be taken forward to preliminary design. Slightly complicated, that then has to go into what's called a single member decision. Okay, it goes public again on our website uh, for a period of time. Uh, and then we're, we're kind of, as it were, free to implement and we can take those uh, shortlist forward to preliminary design. 
Um, as part of that exercise, uh, where we've got complex areas, we're, we're sometimes doing a little bit of the, the kind of sketch design work first to inform that shortlist. In other areas, it's a bit simpler. Um, so that's kind of very much what we're into at this moment in time. Once those shortlists are agreed uh, with members, um, and that's ward members and, uh, and cabinet members, uh, we'll then proceed through for the design work and engage with the wider public uh, on those preliminary designs. So get that wide feedback again um, before we then progress to draw up more detailed designs and do uh, formal consultation. So um, this isn't it in terms of where we are. Um, there's potentially in some instances a couple of rounds of engagements and, and consultations still to go. Um, that's probably appropriate for more complex measures and more complex areas. In other areas where we can, we may just try to install things, so do more piloting work or more trial work, um, and then consult on people through that experiment, consult with people on through that experimental traffic regulation order process. Um, the whole process, though, is designed, as I said on the a sort of final point here, to build consensus amongst communities and give ample opportunity for people to have their say. You know, this is really really interesting this project um the co-design thing i think is super super interesting you know, this idea that uh, essentially what the council is delivering is really what people have come forward with um and then we're giving still though because respecting the fact that often that's the most engaged people in our communities there's still plenty of opportunities for people to to have their say and to build that consensus among the wider audience as we go forward so that's in terms of what we're doing now. Um, I think we're into Q and A for this section, if that's all right. Um, who's got the first question? And there may be some in the chat. Um, Mark, are you going to compare this uh, Q and A section? Is that all right? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I got got one question from Frank Thompson. He asks, uh, "When will the second tranche of livable neighbourhoods uh, be looked at after the first fifteen have already been?" they've been brought forward already and consulted on. So when will we go into that second tranche? That's a really good question. And I really wish, uh, Frank, I could give you a, a, a good answer to it. Um, we have probably on a weekly or fortnightly basis, people asking about this second tranche. And at the moment, I can't commit to anything. And I don't know if, if members could commit to anything who are on the call. Um, um, but certainly we've got to get this first one up and away. And, and we're not quite there yet, I think, before we start a second one. Um, and I think we've also got, um, whilst we've got uh, a number of applications that um, didn't quite make the cut in the first round that you might, you might think uh, would make um, uh, good second round opportunities, I think at the same time, I'd be right in saying that we'd be really interested if, if other neighbourhoods have got ideas that they contact their ward members about seeing if they could bring forward further um, further proposals for livable neighbourhoods you know, for the second tranche when it does come forward. Um, but at the moment, I'm not aware of any plans or dates for that um, as we stand anyway. We're very much focused on getting this first tranche over the line. Mark, is that OK? Thanks. That's great. Yeah, I just noticed uh, Guy, Guy Hodgson, you've got your hand up. Uh, have you got a question, Guy? Hi, uh, hi Ashley. Just a hi, quick Guy. one. Um, I'll try and articulate this right. What if during the co-design process, a measure is not suggested that could be very valuable to that neighbourhood? So, for instance, what if a modal filter, so a through traffic restriction is not mentioned just because people may not be familiar with that or may not have seen it in practice? Um, how do we capture that? Because it still might be an idea. It might not be the right idea, but it might be something worth considering. So um, uh, one of the things that I, again, I'm super keen on is that we keep an open mind. Um, so whilst we we're developing the prelim designs and we're going to take those out to engagement as a next step, um, I think it's really important that if, if when we do that wider engagement, people who haven't, as it were, come forward previously uh, and engaged in the process do then come forward and engage in the process and come up with what are frankly good ideas that 
that no one spotted, you know, I think we have to take those on board and be open minded to them. Otherwise, as in a way, you could argue there's not much point engaging. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think that's a, that that's that's the way we'd handle it. That's certainly the way that we handled the clean air zone project when people came forward with ideas as we went through the process. And I would uh, advocate that we do the same here. That's all right. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, I've got a comment here from Lynn who says, I just want to say how welcome the concept and the method of implementation is. Um, and I've also got a question here from Paul. Can you elaborate on your comment that you might install some pilot interventions and then consult? What is the legal basis for that? Which areas do you have in mind? So um, we don't install pilot. Well, we, I suppose we do in a way. Um, we do, in, uh, yeah, we do in a way. So um, what we would do, Paul, is we would um, we would look at the feedback that we've received to date um, about a particular intervention. Um, so bear in mind, we've already engaged with people back in December 2020. We've gone through this exercise in the summer. So we've got a good feeling for what communities think may be uh, a really good intervention. So we would only put something in in the first place if we thought it, if we thought it was going to be well supported. Um, and obviously we take a sounding from ward members and, uh, and lead members too. Um, so it would have some basis. It wouldn't be a random exercise to start with. Um, and what we then do is, is install the measure and then we would leave it open for comment via this experimental uh, traffic regulation or this experimental TRO process. Um, that's, that's open. There's kind of a very sort of rigid statutory process. That's open for comments for about six months. Um, and then we would take those comments on board, look at what people had said, and then make a kind of final decision is, is the way that that would work. So does that help explain uh, how that would work? So the legal basis, I guess, to summarise, Paul, would be uh, through that experimental traffic regulation order process. OK, I noticed, um, Karis, you had your hand up. I don't know whether you had a question, Karis. Uh, yeah, I was kind of, it's a development of Guy's question, really. Um, so you, and it was a very pertinent question. What happens if somebody, if nobody actually suggested a, suggests a particular measure that would be ideal? And um, so what happens, and I think this is what something we've experienced, where you've got an area which is, fairly large, although actually it's almost exactly the size of the area that the council defined as its optimum. And you've got sort of different areas within that, that when they've suggest made suggestions, have only really thought about their immediate local area. And you, and I mean, you can imagine that the you, in order to make these areas work together, there's going to have to be some external input. How, how are you going to deal with that? Keris, thanks for that. Um, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, so that's, that's why we are at the moment doing uh, sketch designs for some of the areas, particularly Pulteney Estate. Um, so we're taking the, the, the shortlist that's come out of the uh, exhibition and out of the uh, team looking at what to bring forward uh, and then from that shortlist uh, doing a, a kind of preliminary sketch design to inform a scheme that may work. Um, the, the plan then I think like we've talked about would be to come back very briefly to ward members and perhaps uh, and perhaps some others um, to take a sounding about that, and then that informs that shortlist to go forward to that single member decision. Um, it has taken a little bit of unpicking that, to be brutally honest, um, but I think we found a nice way through it that works. We, we've been testing it out in, in other areas, and uh, yeah, that, that seems to provide some logic uh, and some, some ordering, because I completely agree with you, Keris, when we look at the, the shortlist for some areas, it's full of duplications and, and potential conflicts um, that need to be resolved before you can come up with a sensible shortlist that can be taken forward to preliminary design. So I think that addresses the, the concern that you have. Um, 
um, but we can we can have a look at it for the Pulteney Estate area in due course, I'm sure. No other questions at the moment. Um, I don't know whether you wanted to um, move on to Claire, Claire's presentation now, Ashley. Should we do that? I'll stop sharing this one. Lovely, thank you. No problem at all. Claire, have you got your presentation? You have to do it. Yep. Great and stuff. Ready? Okay. Okay, so building on what Ashley has, has already said, so what, what we already know is uh, that the, the dominance of vehicles on our roads is making it less safe for those people that do want to travel in an active fashion, those that are more vulnerable because they are on foot, potentially on a bike and not protected in a, in a big box of metal. Um, so uh, that dominance is making it less safe for the more vulnerable road users. And because of this, the more vulnerable road users don't feel safe to continue to travel in that active fa fashion, perpetuating the problem. Um, the key example, and it's something that Ashley normally refers to in, in, the, in the Liverpool Neighbourhoods presentation, um, is you know parents not feeling safe letting their children walk to school therefore they take them in the car to school which is just adding to the traffic on the roads making it less safe for those that, that do want to travel in a different fashion. Um, we also know that a high proportion of the traffic in Bath is generated whilst doing short trips So through the work that we've been doing in the behaviour change team, which is speaking with people, and that's been through the co-design workshops, through a piece of work we're doing now, uh, focused around, um, you know, small changes to your travel choices. These are just some of the things that we've heard from people, which gives a little flavour of, um, you know, what it is we are, we are seeking to have a discussion about. Um, so we've got a single person household with two cars and those cars are used nine times in a week. Um, getting in the car to travel from the Bathwick area to Lansdowne to walk the dog five days a week. Children having near misses as motorists mount the pavements to presumably get past uh, in a narrow section of the road or getting splashed by motorists driving through puddles, not taking, you know, not preventing these, uh, you know, those poor children that are walking to school from getting absolutely drenched. People driving from central southeast Bath up to Royal Victoria Park three days a week for, for leisure purposes. Cyclists not stopping at controlled crossings, putting those people that are potentially crossing at risk. Um, and scooter riders not paying due care and attention. Obviously they are a, a much quieter vehicle and people are still getting used to, you know, where they might be and therefore putting pedestrians at risk. So that's, that's just a little flavor of some of the things that we're hearing people say to us, which, you know, when you look at them, there could be some small changes that people could implement to try to, you know, make a change to their own contribution to the traffic in our city. Um, so there was a change in the highway code uh, recently, um, or a number of changes actually in the highway code. Um, and it's been updated to include, include three new rules about the hierarchy of road users. And essentially this is, you know, just reiterating hopefully what most people know that the hierarchy places those road users most at risk in the event of a collision at the top of the hierarchy. So those that, as I've said, aren't in a metal box or in a bigger metal box or even bigger metal box, you know, those are at the lower end that are, are going to be more vulnerable should be at the top and everybody below should be thinking about those people when they are using the road in whatever fashion. So it also emphasizes that we all need to behave responsibly 
when we are on the highway. All road users should be aware of the highway code and are considerate to other road users and that they also understand their responsibility for the safety of others, as well as the safety of yourself as well. Again, as Ashley has said, the, the implementation of some of these physical changes in livable neighbourhoods is very much the first stage um, in this process. So we know that around 60% of all vehicle journeys in Bath are generated from within Bath itself. Therefore, when we're hearing people telling us that there's a high dominance of motor vehicles in their livable neighbourhood, we suspect that a part of that is not going to be through traffic because there are, are so many short trips potentially happening within Bath. So that's something that, that can be addressed from within the community that are you know, set to benefit from this livable neighbourhood. So the physical changes um, on the roads and in the local spaces is really only the first part. And that we're, we're calling on residents to consider what small changes they could make to help make this livable neighbourhood the livable neighbourhood that they envisaged when they came to those co-design meetings and they said to us, you know, these are the problems that we feel that we have in our area and we think this could be put in place to try to help, um, you know, us get to a, a better balance. That will involve some effort from the people living there as well. And also to, to enhance the, you know, the benefits of the scheme. So we are looking for people to think about the small changes to their travel habits that, you know, you can even just make once or twice a week. And if we all do that, that can make a real difference to our environment. Kickstart new habits for yourself and for your family. Um, they can benefit your health, your well-being and also your enjoyment of the city. We, we hear so many people tell us that Bath is a, a small walkable city yet we still see, you know, a large volume of traffic. So it's, it's encouraging people to think about those small trips where they could do it in a slightly different fashion. So we are looking and encouraging people in living in the livable neighbourhood to take responsibility for their own contributions to air pollution and congestion. We set some expectations on how you could get around. As Ashley said earlier, be a more considerate driver, not only to you know, make active travel safe for others, but to also help, help reduce your, your pollution in that particular journey. Consider alternative means of transport, and that way you can, you can enjoy the journey. So we are hearing people in our, our conversations and you know some of these changes are already happening some of them are as a result of you know what's been happening in uh you know the past three or four years where people have you know seized the opportunity recognized the benefit and you know are continuing to do things differently so working from home is a key one we're hearing people telling us that they've now reduced the number of cars in their household because Whereas there were two adults out and about working five days a week. Nowadays, that's, uh, you know, not even one adult working five days a week away from home. So they've been able to already reduce the number of cars that they've got in their household. Some people are already walking short journeys. They've got into the habit potentially during lockdown. And actually, they've recognised that sometimes it's quicker. Sometimes it's quicker to nip to the local shop to get that pint of milk rather than you know go out find the car get the car started and make that journey in the car sharing trips to school and other activities there are um, apps that some of the local schools have um, bought into to help facilitate sharing it can be done informally as well between groups of friends um, where their activities are, are coordinating uh, we're hearing families telling us that they're, they're planning their leisure time around not using a car. So not all the time, 
obviously some time in families you know you've, you've got commitments to get to work school after school activities where you know you may not have the flexibility to introduce a new mode of transport that might uh, might take you longer or might just require more planning but we are hearing families telling us that when they've got that leisure time they are building in active travel to uh, you know to, to benefit their well-being and also to you know, to think about the cost savings that they that they might get from doing that. Um, meal planning to help reduce the need to nip to the shops more than once a week. Again, a journey that could potentially be done by foot for some people, but others are trying to eliminate the need to do it all together and just keep it all in that one weekly shop. So we are aiming to encourage those living in the liberal, liberal neighbourhoods to, to think about some of the opportunities that they've got to further enhance some of the work that's being done. So um, as she's talked about modal filters, you know, where there's a, a through traffic restriction in an area, um, you know, where you've got a, a through traffic restriction, you're hoping to reduce the volume of, of vehicles passing through your street. So why not facilitate a street party? or a play out day, you know, it doesn't have to be every weekend because these things take a bit of planning. But by doing that, you know, you're, 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 you truly are capturing that street again for, for the residents, allowing them to make full use of the space, get to know each other. We've heard lots of people tell us in the co-design stages that, you know, although the pandemic brought its negatives, it also had some positives in that it allowed people to engage in their streets like they haven't done for a long time. We've told that we've heard people say that, you know, they've got neighbours living in their streets that they used to go to school with that they didn't know lived in their streets. And until the pandemic, until the roads were clearer and people um, encouraged those outdoor meetings and those informal community gatherings, they had no idea that who some of their neighbours were. Um, planting out days, you know, intergenerational activities, encouraging residents to work together to adopt uh, planters if they're being used, for example, um, to um, restrict the, the traffic in the area as the modal filter or potentially in a, in a community gateway where it might have a, a sign in it reminding drivers that this is a village and of the speed limit keeping those those planters attractive uh, offering you know maybe those residents locally that don't have as much garden space the opportunity to adopt a planter work together come together remind those that are using the road that the people are here people live here and this is a space where where people are regularly same with the community litter pick again getting to know your local community hopefully encouraging people to think about their actions when they're in the in the local community. Uh, community hoedowns, again, neighbours working together on a small patch of, uh, of uh, space, maybe offering to support those neighbours that aren't able to get out and do their gardens or, or do the weeding on their paths or, um, you know, around their, around their gardens to, to, to give them the opportunity to get to know those neighbours, offer get engaged in the conversation as well as getting a bit of exercise and um, you know, brightening the spaces up. Um, there are a lot of facilities that the local authority are responsible for, which people can report. So reminding neighbors how to report things such as um, overgrown trees, if they're from a public space or, or hedges or weight restriction breaches, um, you know, there, there are facilities to report this, holes in road, damaged pavements, etc. So it's important that people know how to report these issues so that they can they can be dealt with either by the local authority, if it's the local authority's responsibility, or, you know, in some instances where it's um, hedges, for example, or, or trees from a garden, that that responsibility you know, falls to the uh, to the owner of the premises, but there is still a, a facility for reporting it and having action taken. Discouraging drivers from idling their engines or parking on pavements. This is one that we hear 
almost in uh, in every event that we've we've been to so far. Um, and those kinds of things make it much more harder for people that want to use the space actively to do so safely. So some small things that, you know, we're encouraging the communities that, you know, are living in these livable neighbourhoods to, to get involved with and hopefully improve the experience for everybody living locally. And that is the end. Thanks, Claire. We've got a couple of questions for you. Um, first one is, um, how can we convince people who already live in cold effects um, that other areas need safer streets too? Now, how do we convince people who have had an old fashioned view that cars can drive anywhere need to change the way they think? I think these things for everybody will, will hit in a different way. You know, everybody has uh, a different perspective on life. Hopefully with change that that message will come across. You know, we, we, we do all have a responsibility. You know, if we if we are doing something that that can affect other people or our environment, we have a responsibility to to consider how we're acting and what impact that's going to have. Um, it would be nice to you know have some bigger campaigns you know this is something that that, that goes more broadly than than livable neighborhoods it you know reaches across lots of areas where, that the council is um you know working towards and you'd like to think that by you know seeing the change happening in their local community potentially or another neighboring community that that would you know that would encourage others to to think about those those changes um it would be nice to guarantee that we could reach everybody, but I don't necessarily think that's a, a, a realistic view. All we can do is, you know, keep on doing the work that we're doing and hope that, you know, these communities, these livable neighbourhoods end up thriving and, you know, people see the benefits. And as we've already seen, you know, through the, the questions that have been asked here, you know, people chomping at the bit to see something like this in their community and and you know it will it will spread organically through through that kind of process right okay moving on to the next question um having recently gone from a two-car household to a one-car household um why are the council not able to support my decision financially and give myself and others the residents a refund by providing a refund on residential street parking. parking costs. I don't work in the parking team. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, I don't work in the parking team, so I can't answer that um, in a lot of detail, but I understand that it's um, because you are buying into a, a sort of membership as such, so you can't then get a refund when you decide to reduce your your request. But that's my understanding. Ashley, have you got any more? You're on mute, Ashley. Yeah, yeah thanks. <laughs> As always. Um, I haven't got any more, uh, Graham. Uh, sorry, Claire. Um, but I thought it was uh, I thought it was a really interesting idea. And so what I'll do, I'm going to capture that one, if you don't mind, Neil. And I'm going to speak with uh, Andy Dunn in parking and see and see what his thinking is around that. Mm -hmm. I thought it's, it was an interesting it's, point. Yeah, it's come up a, a few times uh, through the conversations so. that we're having. You know, where, where mm. people have done exactly that, they've, you know, they're capitalising. And unfortunately, then they haven't been able to, uh, you know, reclaim any of those costs. Right. That's great. Thank the next, you. Yeah, the next point, Claire, was um, really like the idea of street parties. Um, they're a really good idea. Um, but don't the council charge for closure of streets if you're going to have a street party? Uh, I think there is a charge. I was just going to have a quick... Um, have a quick Google because I can't remember what it was off the top of my head. Ashley, can you remember? I looked at it recently and I can't remember what it was. Um, just going to quickly check on the council website. Oh, I've just been told hundred pounds. <laughs> okay. So yeah, 
There's the answer. <laughs> I believe it varies depending on the kind of event. So there are sort of organised events where you would have, um, you know, a, a formal event which you may have a, a, an event company involved with. And then there's less formal sort of uh, street parties and fairs. And I think it's different for um, the two different events. So that could be for the more the formal where you might have an event management company involved. Great. Thank you. Um, next one is, why is there so little focus on school streets? It would reduce pollution and improve safety at school start end times, whilst also making parents think harder about why they drive to school. We have, oh, actually you're muted, do you want to? We, we, we have got one school street within the programme that was suggested. Um, it had mixed feelings, I think it's fair to say, in amongst the, the general public. Um, school streets involve engagement from the school. So it really does have to be, um, you know, something that the school gets behind. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, while a lot of schools are doing their absolute best to try to encourage parents to really consider you know, their, their, their travel choices and then their behaviour in and around the school. Um, they don't have a huge resource to commit to that. Would that be a sort of fair summary, Ashling? I, I, I must admit, I've been surprised, Keris, about there's not been maybe a couple more school streets come forward, actually, as part of the process. Because um, bear in mind that we are reflecting here on what residents are suggesting is needed in an area. We're not bringing forward uh, ideas, and, 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 and as it were. So it's a slightly different process. I'm also thinking, Claire, that our highways team may be looking at, or, or, or Joe, our policy team may be looking at bringing forward school streets, you know, in the kind of usual fashion um uh you know where they perhaps haven't been suggested by communities if you see what i'm getting at uh, but yeah we have to remember this this is a program that's community-led and as claire says in that community-led process only one school street has so far come forward for consideration Thanks, Ashley. I uh, just got one last comment here at the moment um, from Lynn. She just says, basically reflected on what Claire has said, uh, we need to work actively with those 85% who are keen to see change. Uh, we just need to have hope that a public consensus and a new community norms will finally influence those last few. Which is a nice positive comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we all agree there, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I've, there's nothing, no, no other hands up or no other questions uh, outstanding at the moment. So, Dave, do we want to move on to the next item? Yeah, I think we do, Mark. It's um, it's Rachel, isn't it? Rachel Hudson, Landstein Place West Scheme. Rachel. Hello. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm speaking this evening as an active member of the community in the Lower Lansdowne area and a community Speedwatch volunteer. Um, we formed uh, our Speedwatch team after starting a petition in the area, which gained 620 supporters in 2020, calling for traffic to be calmed and speeds reduced in our area for improvements to pedestrian safety, for neighbourhood roads to be used for neighbourhood traffic, and for all main roads in our area to be enforced at 20 miles per hour. In short, for neighbourhood roads to be shared spaces where cars no longer dominate to the detriment of all other users. Um, we've had numerous accidents in and around Cavendish Road and the streets to the north um, as the traffic has increased through the area, a lot of it uh, from uh, sat -navs. Um, two houses have been crushed into at Cavendish Road um, and railings damaged at Lansdowne Place West and at Lansdowne Crescent in the last year uh, from uh, speeding vehicles. Um, we've had a concrete truck 
um, ignore width and weight restrictions. Um, it got sucked up at the top of Cavendish and emptied its load. Um, we've had coaches ignoring the weight ban and the width restriction too, and they often get stuck as they're turning into Cavendish Road. Um, they have to let all their passengers off so they can lift up uh, to, to lighten their load, and then they can carry on their way, um, on their way to Stonehenge. Um, we've got families, pets um, have been run over in the area, five dogs and six cats at the last count in the last two years. We have wildlife such as deer and badgers run over in the area and too many um, near misses with people to mention um, with cars speeding around narrow historic streets and no calming in place. Um, mums who walk with young children to the four primary schools in the area struggle to cross the junction at Marlborough Tavern uh, because a lot of north and south traffic um, up and down Marlborough Buildings and Cavendish Road is attempting to cross over the east-west traffic. Um, and mums of secondary school aged children worry a lot about them walking to school independently along the local streets, which have turned into speeding cut-throughs uh, for commuters. So we formed a speed watch group to try to tackle the problem. Our group has conducted over 60 hours of speed watch sessions. Um, when we're doing our sessions, um, neighbourhood traffic, so all of our neighbours, um, generally slow and they're getting the message, but people who are using the neighbourhood road as a cut through at the two sort of busy times of the day in particular, are more insensitive to our efforts. Um, we sometimes have clocked speeds that reach 58 miles per hour in a 20 mile per hour um, road where the cars are sort of, um, you know, having to swerve in and out to miss one another. Uh, pedestrians seem to be very appreciative of our efforts. Pedestrians that are both locals um, and lots of the tourists that are heading our way to the Cotswold Way or on one of the many um, guided historic tours um, that come up into um, the Lower Lansdowne area. Um, and as a result of some pedestrians seeing our speed watch, uh, we know that there's been another speed watch on Lansdowne Road uh, near the two schools that has been established and a speed watch formed on Marlborough Buildings after a child was hit by a car at the junction with Royal Avenue. Um, but the one thing that I would like to say about Speedwatch is that it's just deeply upsetting because we're very limited um, as to how much time we can physically be out on the roads doing our sessions. And we're not allowed to do sessions in the rain and we're not allowed to do sessions in the dark. So even if we just had a huge team that could do you know, sessions all the time, um, we can't actually physically be there all the time. And as we remove our vis high visibility jackets, the cars just return to their previous speeding um, um, uh, behavior. Um, the other thing to mention is that our area's got a lot of street fronted townhouses, um, many subdivided into flats, five flats per property, lots of them rented by young couples who don't have the opportunity to use bikes, even though they would quite like to use bikes because there's nowhere to store them. They're not allowed to store them in the, in the hallways of the HMOs or communal buildings because um, landlords are not allowed to permit it because of fire risk. And they're not allowed to put them on the railings because of obstruction on the highway. Um, so our area is also hoping that not only will the traffic be um, calmed and neighbourhood roads return to neighbourhood roads um, and, and traffic calmed on all the main roads in the area as well. We're hoping that we'll get bike storage hangers trialled in the area um, around sort of uh, All Saints Road and Park Street where we've got more um, rental properties and flats where, um, the, the, you know, the young tenants just cannot physically carry the bikes up to some of these flats. And you certainly can't do it if you've got an e-bike because they're so heavy. Um, 
the voice scooter trial has worked really well um, up in our area and we've got about 20 parts at the end of Lansdowne Place West which uh, is where I live um, they're used to commute a lot by people um, really interesting to see the age range that are using them to, at the moment it's obviously to begin with it was younger people probably early 20s um, but we, we're ranging up to 60 up in our neck of the woods. Um, so as they've come up the hill, it's very much now less about, you know, youngsters having a bit of a giggle on them in the centre of town, which probably they were doing at the very, very start of the trial. And now it's properly used by people commuting. We've got several building sites up in the area and we often see... Um, lots of the builders who've parked in the park and ride to avoid avoid paying the clean air charging zone and they're using the voice scooters to come to site every day which is is, is absolutely brilliant um, and my own family um, one of the older ends of that um, age range um, is using them to commute as well so there's definitely an appetite in the area for change amongst those who can use their cars less so, um, I mean, really, just to sort of summarise, we see Liverpool neighbourhood planning as an opportunity to address, address the imbalance of car dominance on uh, non-main roads, which encourage local people to feel safer walking and cycling in the neighbourhood streets, to encourage parents to let their children walk or cycle independently to school, perhaps ultimately to encourage those able-bodied people to use their cars less for shorter journeys, whilst freeing up the roads a little bit more for essential traffic and those with mobility issues who have no choice and have to use their cars. Um, and let's just remember that for those people who seem to, to like the idea of change a little bit less, um, we've already got these initiatives in Bath. They just weren't called low traffic or livable neighborhood initiatives. Whitcomb Parade is a really good example. Pulteney Bridge with its bus gate is a really good example. We have bus gates all the way through the centre of town. We have one-way systems across the city. We have speed calming and we have some areas with retractable, retractable bollards such as at the end of Perrymead um, down in Whitcomb and um, at the end of the Royal Crescent. We would never dream of reinstating that as a through route. Um, so we feel that if we start with change in our area as a trial and it works and we're one of these 15, um, as other areas put in place similar initiatives, Bath could become a better city to walk in for residents and visitors. And if we reduce the speed of prevailing traffic on all the main roads, then people will be encouraged to walk even more and to give cycling a go. And if we can get the speed down to 20 miles an hour as the prevailing speed on our main roads, I would argue that we don't even need segregated cycle lanes anymore because most people are fearful of speeding traffic and that's what stops them getting on their bikes. So we're looking forward, um, many of us in the Lower Lansdowne area, to seeing how the highways officers have taken our ideas We'll develop them um, to make our area a little bit safer so that our residents are encouraged to use their cars a little bit less uh, and reduce traffic across the whole city so thank you rachel that's uh, that was uh, that was very interesting has anybody got any questions for rachel and the, some of the schemes up at landslide i'm just having a look mark i don't think there's, there's something in the chat Um, the only question that popped up while Rachel was talking was, um, it's probably back to either, uh, probably back to Ashley, this is, it's about um, how we define what main roads are in Bath, better known as the circulation plan. Does anyone kind of know the answer to that question? I, I, I know a little bit. Um, others might know more, so please jump in if needs be, or if able to. Um, there, there is discussion about a circulation plan. It's not part of livable neighborhoods. Uh, it's another program of work or project that's going on. Um, I think at the moment it's still with Sophie, Sophie Broadfield and her team. Um, but yes, there is work being progressed on a circulation plan, um, uh, but it's not part of the livable neighborhoods program per se. Thanks, Ashley. 
I don't think there's no. any other hands up at the moment. So back to you, Dave. Yeah, uh, our next speaker is uh, Guy, Guy Hodgson. Guy, you're going to talk about the Southland scheme, aren't you, at um, over at Western Village? Say that again. You're going to be talking about the Southland scheme, potential? Um, ooh, probably not, because that's not what I've prepared. <laughs> what have you prepared? Uh, but I, I'll be talking about uh, what I was asked to talk about was what does the livable, livable neighbourhood on Southlands mean for me? Oh, no, that's splendid. Carry on. Shall, shall I go with that one? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. All right, good. Um, so, yeah, good evening, everyone. Enjoyed it so far. Um, my name is Guy Hodgson. Sorry, my screen is getting a bit funny. Uh, and I live on Southlands in Western, in North West Bath, not Western Supermare. Um, yeah, the question I was asked, what does livable neighbourhoods mean for me? Um, I thought that was an interesting question, actually, and it made me reflect a bit on what me means in this case. So I'm relatively young, relatively fit. I've got fairly good mobility, although I've actually hurt my knee at the minute. Um, so do I need drop curbs? No. Do I need step-free access to the high street in Western? No. Um, do I even need pedestrian crossings, actually? Not, not, I don't most of the time, if I'm honest. I can scamper across the road where I want. So that's a very sort of zeroed in view on myself. Um, I mean, the through traffic restriction on Southlands will be a minor inconvenience, but um, sometimes I go one way out of the road and sometimes I go the other. So I'm kind of fairly chilled about that. And so I, I thought about that and I thought, well, looking at late livable neighbourhoods in that way is a bit like looking at the NHS and saying, um, I don't see the point in maternity services because personally, I'm never going to give birth. So I thought maybe I should look at three of the interventions that are suggested and what they might mean to people other than me. So the first one I'll just quickly talk about is step-free access from Southlands to the high street. People don't know the area, um, sort of the most direct route to our shops has a, a long flight of steps on it. So who's gonna benefit from those being addressed, those steps being removed? Um, I mean, anyone who uses a mobility aid. So when we talk about mobility aids, it's often wheelchair users that spring to mind, mobility scooters, but there's a whole world of mobility aids beyond that. So a push chair is a mobility aid. A wheel chopping basket is a mobility aid. So Im immediately that's just one aspect of livable neighbourhoods where we're benefiting a, a huge number of people. A second aspect we could look at, drop curbs, um, continuous pavements. Those are the things that are appearing at the minute on the Upper Bristol Road. Uh, who's going to benefit from easier to cross roads? I mean, really, I think everyone actually benefits from clear and direct pedestrian routes. Um, but especially the mobility aid users, again, and I just point out this point that it's you don't need a whole flight of steps to enormously discriminate against a huge range of people in our society you just need one step which is the curb so if we can start addressing those steps i think we truly are building a much more livable neighborhood um and then i mean the big one that we, we talk about a lot <laughs> and it gets all of the attention, the restriction on three motor vehicles. I think the big beneficiary here is a group who generally get consulted, well, they don't get consulted at all. In fact, we talked about school streets earlier. And again, this group will not have been consulted and often overlooked and it's children. Um, by which I, I mean, anyone under the age of 18, but particularly uh, primary age children, I mean, Southlands itself has dozens of children living on it. And it's a route for the hundreds of children every day for Western All Saints, for St Mary's, um, Oldfield School, 
And I mean, some of the behavior that I see by through traffic on the way to school, I've seen cars driving along pavements. I see just regular speeding. It's, uh, it's yeah, an epidemic of speeding really. Uh, I've seen children or twice come within just a whisker of being hit by through vehicles. One child, their foot was run over. So that's how close they were. Just think about that. They ran over their foot. So had they been a few inches the other way, they would have run over them. So I just feel we need to do a lot more to protect our children, particularly when they're walking, cycling, scooting to school. Um, and the discussion around through traffic restrictions, is, I feel it's very adult centred a lot of the time, but it's our children who are facing a crisis of physical inactivity and huge challenges around mental health. And I just feel the root of that is lack of safe space for children to socialise on our street um, and to live independent lives as well. So uh, my son can't independently visit his friends who live on this street, not, not all of them, but some of them, because of the speed and the volume of vehicles. And to be honest, it only takes one idiot per hour. And I think there's no, that's not a scientific measure, but I'm pretty sure we do get one idiot per hour for about 18 hours of the day. And it, the parents only need to see that once, parents and carers, and that's enough. They can't let their children out on a long leash. Um, they can't independently go to the shops and they can't play in our streets. We, in the modern houses on this street, the gardens are very small. The road is the socialization space here. It, it is the play space. Um, and I think we need to find just a better balance. This is, I think I've heard this several times this evening, just a better balance between adult needs and child needs. And, um, and also for the adults to think about the children a little bit more because we just have so little representation. I'm happy to be contradicted on this, but I feel there's very little representation of under 18s by themselves. It has to be through an adult. And last page. Oh yeah, back to the original question. What, what, what does it mean for me? Yeah, I just think it's, it's a chance to find a fairer balance between the different people and their different needs in our societies to think a bit beyond what I need today just for me. And let's not forget, I might need not need drop curbs and continuous footways and nice quiet roads where I can cross wherever I want now. But a day will come when <laughs> I probably do. And on that basis, I'm totally happy to give this a go six to 12 months it's a trial we'll see we'll see how it goes and, and judge it as we go along um there's no guarantee that it works um but yeah am i willing to try it absolutely so that's it from me sorry if i've overrun no 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 you, no, you haven't I, that's absolutely splendid thank you for that that was very very interesting indeed has anybody got any questions for guy there's some nice comments in the um, chat about other people from other areas were saying exactly the same thing about parents and the children in the area are so scared to let them walk to school independently. I know that area very well. And uh, during the school day in the morning and the evening, there are three very significant schools all within walking distance. There are a lot of kids walking. Yeah, I mean, if, if we road. defined rat runs of people, then this is a, a child rat run. This is not, not a very nice way to talk about them. But, has has um, anybody anybody got any questions for, for Guy? Because if not, I, I do I do have one, but I'm, I don't want to take up the time because it's not about me. It's about all you. Has anybody, anybody out there got their hand up? I can't see everybody's face. There's no, no hands at the moment, Dave. Hey? There's no, no hands at the moment, no. Just one question, Guy. Obviously, you say about the 12-month the, the, the trial, the 12-month period. What would you what would you view as being a success for you and the other residents in that area to suddenly go to the council? Do you know what? Let's 
get on with it and make it happen. Mm. Um, what are those trigger points? It, it, it's it, it's funny, isn't it? Because the the restriction on premium motor vehicles is almost just takes it back to how you feel a residential street should be. Mm. Um, it, it, we've we've just gained normal. <laughs> if you like a street where you you know people can amble up the street i know people there'll be people maybe on this call that don't agree with that but i think a residential street should be quiet enough that you can amble up the street that you can teach your children to cycle on the street because you're not permanently having to take them off that children can set up a set of goals in the street if they want i don't know if it'll ever be quite that yeah. quiet um so that's one aspect and then the exciting stuff happens beyond that um it's the social interactions it's the ability i'll tell you one thing which would be a huge success there's a boy that lives on the other side of the green a friend of my son you can't go and see him independently and that boy can't come over here he can't proactively be part of the gang so my son can socialize with some children that aren't across southlands the, the main drag of southlands because we're clustered around a green and that those two children, in fact, are socially excluded. I don't think they even realise that. But, and they're just nearly old enough to cross the road now, but their parents just wouldn't let them. So it would be a huge success if um, they could just come over here independently and just play. And like I say, we talk about busy roads. Someone might come here and say, well, it's not that busy. It's a car every two minutes or something. That's nothing. But... As a parent, you only have to see the idiot motorists that come down here at 40, and that's it. You will not allow your children to do all sorts of activities because you're scared of that occasion when the idiot comes. So um, that would be one success. And, and also, I do dwell a lot on what happens on the parallel route. You know, we're the classic situation where there's, there's two options, and you can come along Southlands or you can come along High Street. Um, so, you know, I actually talked about the importance of being upfront about the data. Let's we'll have baseline data on traffic movements of motor vehicles. Um, let's look at those after six months, after seven months, whatever, and see has it had a profound effect on High Street? Is it fair? Um, has it fundamentally changed the nature of High Street? Um, in a way that isn't fair on those residents. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. And then, yeah, if we can get rid of those steps, oh my goodness, like I say, it makes naff all difference to me. But when you become a parent and you have a push chair or a carer and you've got a push chair or you push someone in a wheelchair, you're suddenly so grateful for those guys who chain themselves to buses in the 1980s, I think, in Parliament Square to force disability legislation through because you need those drop curbs, you need a lift at a railway station, you need buses that kneel at the bus stop and have raised curbs, mm. um, you need automatic doors, you know, the world changes completely. I'll yeah. stop talking. <laughs> That's very interesting, Guy. Thank you ever so much indeed. Um, now we've got one final speaker but i believe there might have been some problem with your it katina can you are you with us i'm okay yes thank you sorry it's <laughs> I had to go to the phone but um i just i think my brief was more talking about maybe some of the issues on entry hill and um i'd like to introduce myself i mean what uh rachel and guy were talking about i can completely understand I agree with everything oh my goodness it it's I don't think comforting is the right word um but I it's just interesting to know the same kind of problems happen um throughout Bath so what I was wanting to say is that I you know I chair the local residents association and I was going to run through some of our safety concerns because Entry Hill is a, a very bizarre residential road we're a, a 20 mile per hour zone and we run we run parallel to the wells way which is the a road and the middle section of our road 
that that runs you know just below the golf course um the entry hill golf course is quite wide and that area there leads itself to a lot of speeding and tailgating um overtaking of cars if drivers are even trying to do 20 on our road um they tend to get tailgated and this does cause a lot of driver tension and aggressive behavior and then we've got um the bridge that can barely accommodate two-way traffic and that has two narrow pavements on either side of it with lovely drops onto the golf course and walking over that you do feel quite exposed um as pedestrians and then you know you've got north of the bridge where there's a lot of congestion at commuter commuter times but even outside of the commuter times it only takes something like four or five cars going either way traveling in each direction and that creates a problem so then this leads to arguments and then we've got drivers are forced to drive on the pavement and then during these commuter times there's quite a bit of congestion where entry hill meets greenway lane and then outside the devonshire pub so there's all this traffic that's piled up there and then in amongst that there's children walking to and from school and they're having to navigate this so beach and cliff is at um is at the bottom really of entry hill and it's on greenway lane and the field at the back i mean a, a lot of children walk that way to school and it is you know it's it's not pleasant to witness it you don't have a pleasant walk down entry hill and then you don't have a pleasant drive either if you just want to use your car and so we started a um well some of our residents and myself started a community speed watch team and that was in february this year and so far we've been really good we've we've managed to do 67 hours um and the average speed of the speed is recorded is 36.8 miles per hour and we may have a top speed in bains of um the top speed so far has been 61 miles per hour on our road in a 20 mile per hour zone so you know this is all going on and we're still not sure what's happening with our golf course yet so that hasn't even opened as a leisure facility and we've got you know uh, we've got problems on our road and it's all these safety issues and they need addressing i mean we've got some good news of hopefully a residence parking zone will be implemented um just you know north of the bridge on entry hill and maybe on wells way a little bit and a little bit south of the bridge but our next steps as a community will be continuing with the community speed watch and um we will wait for our livable neighborhood options to be fed back uh to the entry hill residents and then we can work with the council and residents and our livable neighborhoods team and just hopefully come up with some really good solid safe solution and long term solutions for entry hill because it's it's just not pleasant and that's really it's quite short compared to everyone you know other speakers but i don't think i'm over exaggerating i mean when we first started the residents association we i put out a message saying to people what's your main concern and it's traffic and it's safety all the time so that's me done <laughs> hopefully i've got my my point across about entry hill but it's just it's coming up with solutions to it now that's splendid katrina thank you ever so much anybody got any questions oh sorry no oh yes guy um just a quickie I, i we we've talked a lot about vehicles and numbers and speed and things how how will we baseline active travel so the the volumes of people walking and cycling and all that other good stuff and how's that going to be monitored going forward because traffic's quite easy you put traffic counts in but how do you count people who are all over the place and their routes taken all over the place thank you so do you mean fit that one up so um yeah. 
Guy, I've got no clue how the technology works, but the cameras that we installed to do the baselining in, around all the through traffic restrictions monitored um, uh, vehicular movements, but also walking and cycling as well. Uh, so we've effectively baselined all the usual modes. Um, and then we'll continue to do that as we go forward. Because in theory, it's important that we do that because uh, arguably vehicle movements will decrease and walking and cycling will increase in those areas. And so we need to be able to understand that that is exactly what's happened. It's not just that we've reduced the number of vehicles. Um, and then I think that will help inform that decision that you were talking about once the once the trial is over, uh, trial period is over. So yeah, um, we'll, we've baselined all modes, not just um, not just vehicle traffic. Okay, there's one other point in the chat. Um, that's uh, Frank just asks: uh, speed restrictions such as the 20, foot, 20 mile an hour limit will only ever succeed if there is enforcement. What discussion has there been with the police around enforcement procedures? Um, so the 20 mile an hour limits themselves, not strictly my area. Um, I know though we do liaise with the police on the programme, because obviously when we are changing the road network, we have to liaise with the police and the emergency services more broadly to, to make sure that we are uh, not doing something that will cause them a problem. Um, so I, I can't actually answer that, but I could take that one away, Mark, and I can mm. ask Chris or Paul um what regulation goes on i'm fairly sure but i'm 99 sure there is a regulation meeting with the police but i suspect like all public services they are incredibly stretched and um you know it's a bit like rachel i think you were saying earlier you know it's all right when you're there but as soon as you go it just it just comes back doesn't it um and my suspicion is it's the same with enforcing 20 mile an hour zones you have some impact for a short period of time but then it it disappears I just add something to that so that the behaviour change work, you know, the, the thing that I said earlier about reminding drivers that people are here. So all of those activities, you know, street closures for street parties, planting days, everybody's wearing high vis, community litter picks, everyone's wearing high vis. It's that reminder, that regular reminder to drivers that there are people here. You know, we've, we've had discussions with some of the schools in the Liverpool neighbourhoods about encouraging them to offer high-vis jackets to the children that are walking to school. Again, it's, it's a visual reminder that there are people here. You know, Rachel, uh, you know, um, mentioned it as soon as they take their high vis off people start acting differently but the, the same is true in the reverse if you put your high vis on you're more visible people behave differently so again it's it's, it's mm -hmm. this is part of the reason for encouraging people then in this community to take up those kind of activities which are small in themselves but that combined effort that regular effort can help to yeah. to have that impact as well absolutely Rachel you've got your hand up Sorry. Um, uh, re recently, I had a meeting with Mark Shelford. Uh, one of the things that I've learned through one of the Community Speed Watch uh, coordinator meetings was that um, the police have access to um, mobile uh, speed enforcement cameras. So, uh, sh not mobile in terms of those that are in the vans, that are in the marked vans, which sort of scream to the drivers, you know, we're here for just half an hour, so slow down when you're driving past, but don't change your habits all the time because we're not gonna be here tomorrow. But actually um, several areas could share um, a camera. So you, you have the, the data point installed where you could potentially use your CAS, um, uh, infrastructure for that and an area could share with another five areas um, a speed enforcement camera and because you have the signage then in your road motorists never know whether or not the camera is there or not and Mark Shelford was saying that that had been trialed um, in other places now funding wise for that it's quite tricky because 
areas outside of Bath can apply for their to their parish councils for funding for that. And of course, we don't have access to that because we don't have a parish council in, in Bath, um, but potentially it could be part of the sorts of measures that could be funded by livable neighbourhood planning. So mm -hmm. that was just something which um, uh, Malcolm Baldwin from Circus Area and myself uh, recently found out when we met with um, the, the uh, with Mark Shelford. So mm -hmm. that that could be potentially one thing that people looked at. Yeah, no, absolutely. The uh, mobile speed vehicle was in Peasdown in the main high street today, which is a 20 mile an hour zone. Um, and occasionally you see them, I think at Bloomfield, Bloomfield Road again is another 20 mile an hour zone. Um, and and it, it's often there. So they are out and about, but the community speed watch was, there was a lot more of it about a few years ago when there was a bit more money and the police were able to, um, to, to support it a bit more, but it's something that we can, we can certainly have a look at. Cause I think it's still, I think it's still in existence. I think it's still being run from Radstock police station across all, all of Bath and North East Somerset, but I'll, I'll, I'll have a look and I'll find out. I'll let you know, um, Rachel. Um, I'm conscious of time because we're literally there almost at half past seven. Unless anybody else has got anything else they'd like to say. Can I just say thank you ever so much to Ashley and Claire for coming and presenting tonight. And thank you for the three members of the public who come along. It's been really, really interesting. It's a really different way of doing it. And it's very useful for us as council officers in particular and the councillors to get a real grassroots view about what it means, what these topics mean for you actually right down at the grassroots level. So that's been really helpful. Thank you ever so much for all your time, everybody. The next meeting will be on Monday, the 20th of February, 2023. So after Christmas, and it'll probably be a bit of a hybrid one. I think we're probably gonna go for an online stroke <coughs> public meeting and the topics uh, Mark and I are going to be discussing that with some of the councillors, but obviously livable neighbourhoods and some of the traffic and transportation issues at the moment are at the forefront of an awful lot of people's minds. So it's going to be quite useful, but thank you so much and please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Thanks everyone.